Straight from the Mayor's Mouth, with Matthew Dickerson from Dubbo Regional Council. Hello everyone, and welcome to Straight from the Mayor's Mouth. Hello there, Matt, how are you? Hot. Gee, it's, it's been a hot week, hasn't it? Incredibly hot, hasn't it, eh? Welcome back to summer. <laughs> it's a bit like that. We seem to have had okay-ish mm-hmm. over the last few weeks, but this week... has been quite week, pleasant, really, up until now again. Yeah, this week it's hot, and some people have commented to me that it's been hot when you read the temperature, but it does seem to be more humid. Now, whether mm. or not that's just our mind playing tricks with us, or whether it's just the fact that we're all getting a bit older, but it does seem to be more humid, and that makes it mm. a bit tougher to handle those hot days. Yes, well, you normally sort of think Dubbo. You get these 36, 37, 38 degree days or even 40 degree days like we had this week. But you normally get that dry sort of humidity, don't you? You know, mm. 25, 26% at best. But we've been getting up around 40% humidity. It feels very much like a coastal region. It does a bit like that, doesn't it? And mm. even I go for a bike ride early in the morning if I can, if I, if I can fit into my schedule. But there's been some mornings there when normally I rely on being a little bit chilly, even in summer, when you get out on the bike, but there's some mornings I've gone out and I've gone, it's hot, and I'm mm. talking, I, I normally go 5.30 or 6 a.m. Yep. It's been hot then, and I'm thinking, wow, I wouldn't yeah. want to be someone, a, a tradie, working outdoors in the middle of the day, like that feels hot. A sort of, uh, I always quite looking, uh, enjoy looking over at the sort of see what's up in the coast during those sort of days, and thinking to myself, should I be over on the coast on a day like today? It might have been maybe Wednesday last week, and Sydney hit around about 40 degrees, and they had about 48 or 49% humidity, and I thought, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm happy where I am, I'd simply cop this 30%. Yeah, that's right, exactly right. All right, buddy, let's jump straight into it. So looking at there with today, uh, the big thing, of course, that uh, went down during the week was, of course, the Australia Day ceremony. Wellington, let's kick off with Wellington. Uh, The 25th of January, we had the um, celebrations on out there. How did Wellington go? Well, really good, and we actually thought at one stage we were going to have a protest. There was A, a story, protest? Yeah, there was a story oh, okay. there where one of the gentlemen, and I know the person, and, and apparently he was going to protest because he didn't agree with the fact that council was having the event on the 25th of January, mm-hmm. not the 26th of January. Right. And so I went and talked to him about it, and it's a free democratic nation that we live in, so you've got your rights to have your say, but yeah. I did mentioned that maybe there are appropriate ways to have your say, maybe not when you've got a lovely ceremony with 250 people mm. there and you're really trying to do the right thing by these people, award winners, our ambassador, etc. Mm. Anyway, I don't know that I got very far and there was a few other discussions about what might happen, but in the end, nothing. Mm. So that was it. That that's good. It all sort of fizzled out. Good. Uh, well, good. nothing started, so there was nothing to fizzle out, yeah. but it was a good event and we did change the timing. You talk about the heat. Mm. We did change the timing a little bit this year. Because we wanted to go into the slightly cooler night, so we was had it cooler it by five, the time. Well, <laughs> we had it at five thirty. <laughs> it was about a thirty-eight or thirty-nine degree day, wasn't That's it? Right. We had it yeah. at five thirty p.m. last year. This year we pushed it back to six thirty p.m. Yes, it was still pretty warm at six thirty p.m. When we mm. finished the ceremony by about seven thirty, we then sat around and went, "Oh, gee." You could probably start it at 7.30, but mm. that's the decision for council to make for next year. But it was a good event. We had Reese Muldoon. He was yes. our ambassador. So what's, what uh, What did he talk about, our good old Reese? Well, he talked a little bit about play school. He couldn't help himself. Right, he talked yes. a little bit about the background in terms of his association with regional areas. His dad used to be a school teacher in Walgett. Mm, so he good profession. Under- well yeah, done. Yeah, yeah, good profession. But also, he visited Walgett on many occasions to see his dad and just mm. he had a bit of an understanding of regional areas. So he just... As with most ambassadors, a few little funny stories, mm. a bit of information, and just a bit of inspiration, I suppose, about yeah. what you might do in your life. Yep. But we also had our award winners down there. We had our local Indigenous elder, Herb Smith, who gave a speech. We had the Deputy Mayor, Richard Ivey, so he did the yeah. council formal council speech. And, uh, of course, we've just got, I suppose, that real buzz that you get that you're talking about Australia mm. and what a great nation mm. it is and, mm. and the award winners and I love hearing from the award winners and I, I love hearing the the things that they've done so when you read the citation out as such about mm. why they won this award you just sit back and go wow mm. they've done a lot oh wait there's more oh, there's more still mm. so they do some fantastic things mm. in that And so who was the Wellington Citizen of the Year? Dr Mike Orgy was the Wellington right. Citizen of the Year right. and uh, now you've said that, I probably should go through all the, the yeah, winners yeah. there. So, yeah, so that was that was Mike. You had Carolyn White, or Carol, as she's normally called, was the Senior Citizen of the Year. Nice. The Young Sports Person of the Year was Samantha Thompson. Now, this was a tricky one. We didn't have any entries in the Senior Sports Person of the Year. Right. You have to be 18 or older to win the Senior Sports Person of the Year. I think it's just called mm. Sports Person of the Year. Mm. Samantha Thompson... 
turned 18 on the 27th of January. Oh, you're kidding. So so she didn't qualify for a senior, but she was still a junior. She was still a junior. Okay. And the, the problem wasn't, I was on the judging panel, the problem mm. was there was a lot of competition in the junior category, right, and there okay. was probably three, maybe four worthy winners of the junior category, yep. but Samantha stood out from all of those as a junior. So was she a swimmer, or what was she? Uh, Samantha is a swimmer, yeah. and uh, again, just some of the things that, they do. She travels to Dubbo again in the citation that was read out. Mm. Travels to Dubbo twice a day right. to swim in the pool here. Now you've Just got a good pool, isn't it? Just it that is. simple travel alone. You've got a good pool in Wellington, but of course you need the coaching, so mm. you've got a good coach in Wellington. And again, you just you get inspired by hearing the the hard work that they put in, and obviously their parents and mm. family put in as well. But that one there in particular, we actually did talk about it. the committee. Said, well, surely by a day we can change it. And and I actually said in that p- discussion. The rules are clear. It does say you've got to be 18 or older. Mm. I don't think we should just change mm. it because it would be nice to have a sports oh, person it, in a it's, junior. It's more unfortunate than anything else, isn't it, really? Yeah, it is. So that's interesting. Uh, you had the Macquarie Correctional Centre. They had an exhibition called Inside Art. Right. And that was the community event of the year. Right. So, a- again, it's… Was, was that about painting or something that the uh, prisoners did? Or? Yeah, they did. They did. It was an exhibition there. It was quite fascinating, actually, yeah. watching or, or looking at that. So, uh, again, you had some of the people from the Correctional Centre there very proud to come mm. along. The prisoners didn't come along. The, <laughs> the staff came along to pick up the award. But they yeah. were pretty thrilled, the yeah, fact yeah. that something that had been organised in Wellington and… I don't know too many other places that have done something like that. No, I, I remember when no. the exhibition was on, I thought that's a pretty interesting event. So yeah. I think I've covered all of them now, hopefully all of the different winners of the different awards down there. And you also had the Community Service Awards. I won't go through all those, yeah. but you had the Community Service Awards that they give out in Wellington as well. They so had a good crowd there? They did. Yeah. My estimation was probably 250. Okay. They had some storeholders there. They had, uh, obviously, the, the crowd there. We had some guests in terms of our official area there. Mm. We had a local member, Dougal Saunders, had a number of councillors turned up as well. So overall, yeah, mm. a, a good roll-up, a good event, and it just feels good yeah. when you're at an event like that. So we've also had Dubbo, so we can talk a bit about yeah, Dubbo so, so if you like. Dubbo, of course, is the following day on uh, January the 26th. Now, this uh, event took place in the morning, so I'm assuming it might have been a little bit cooler because I know that uh, it still was a pretty warm day there. I thought it was still going to be a pretty hot day, mm. but it wasn't too bad. It wasn't as bad as I thought. And again, we brought that back even earlier. Last year, we started at 8.30. We thought that was reasonably early, but it was yep. still pretty hot by the end. Yep. So this year, we went to 8 a.m., which is a pretty early start to the day, but I don't mind the logic of it. it started at 8, you're done by 9, it's still not too hot. Mm. And the way the staff set up our t- uh, chairs across the area you're pretty much in shade until after 9 o'clock. Yeah, so nice. that's not too bad. Yep. But then you've got the full day to go out and do whatever yeah, you want to do. Your own sort of thing to celebrate Australia Day. Yeah. yeah. And I did talk to another council, a nearby council, that said that they were having their event at 9.30. Mm. Well, an hour later, 10.30, mm. bit, mm. bit after that. It's probably would have been post 30 plus by that stage in Dubbo. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So anyway, that was good. So I know you can ask me about the award winners. I'll go through those in a moment. Sam Cawthorn was the ambassador. He was yes. good as well. He spoke you know, he, well? He did, and he did tell a funny story about the fact that when he first met the Prime Minister, and this is back, Kevin Rudd was the mm. Prime Minister at the time, Sam's only got one arm. He lost an arm in an accident. And so he has different arms that he puts on sometimes. He's got a bionic arm or he's got a prosthetic arm. Depends on yep. what he's doing. So this particular day, he had a prosthetic arm. It just looked like a normal arm. And of course, he shook the Prime Minister's hand and it is his right arm, right. shook from his hand, and the arm came away. Oh, no. So the Prime Minister oh, ended up no. holding onto Sam's arm it's without like one of those Sam sort of comedy movies, isn't it? Yeah, sort of thing. Oh, you can almost right. see it, you know, a flying high type soul. And know, he was so. pretty good telling the story. He was pretty relaxed about it all, about the fact he's only got one arm, mm. and the fact that he said, You always want to make sure that you meet someone like the Prime Minister. You want it to be memorable. He said, well, that was memorable. <laughs> <laughs> Left an impression, literally. It there did, it was. Absolutely did. <laughs> and even, I mean, he, he created a nice relaxed atmosphere, which was great. Right, and even at right. one stage there when I was talking and I was about to do the award winners, and I did just, as you say, you, you said, oh, can I ask the ambassador to come and give us a hand? And as I've said that, I've gone, <laughs> oh, well, maybe not you know, two hands, Sam. And, and again, you kind of say something, and as you say, think, yeah. am I offending the guy? But the fact that he joked about it before, and I That's thought right. it was pretty safe. And, oh, he's a and very he laid-back chuckled. guy, isn't he? That's he he was. Yeah, yeah. And, and I did talk to him about that afterwards. And he said, no, no, he said, that was funny. So I thought it was funny. That was That's good. Great. So, That's so great. our winners, and sorry, we had Sam speak as well. 
And then Tatum Moore was our Aboriginal representative. Right. And yes. uh, and obviously I spoke there rather than the Deputy Mayor in terms of a council representation there. And then we had our 18 new citizens. Okay, Now, 18 is not that many. Sometimes we have much larger mm, at mm. Australia Day. But we only did our last citizenship ceremony on the 28th of November, I think it was. That's so right. yep. it wasn't that yep. long ago. So it's only been kind of another month and a half for, mm. for the numbers to mm. build up again. But that was fantastic as well to have 18 citizens. And then the winners, so we've got the citizen of the year was Molly Croft. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Now, it's an interesting one. She's 17. Yes. So yes. she could qualify for the young citizen of the year. She's won it before, so you yes. can't get it more than oh, once. Oh, she's an inspiring young lady. But it was interesting. Again, sitting around the table at this mm. discussion – there was a lot of discussion around there were a number of different nominations for C- Citizen of the Year, mm. and you can imagine some of the other ones were older than mm. Molly. And it was interesting, okay, who's made the greatest impact here? Mm. Has someone who's made a contribution over 30 years that they've been contributing in different ways, or is someone that's only young who hasn't got the possibility of making a contribution over 30 years, mm. are they more appropriate? Now, again, the committee talked about that, discussed that, and in the end it was decided that Molly Croft was the most appropriate person mm. to pick up that oh, particular And award. I think just deserving as well, you know, for what she's achieved in such an incredibly short space of time yeah. and continues to achieve on a daily basis. Uh, she is a remarkable young lady. There's no two ways. That's right. And actually, Sam, I spoke to Sam about her, and one of the things that we mentioned was Stand Up 2023. Yes. She spoke of that, and Sam said he was there, he saw her speak, and I'd actually mentioned the fact there were 10,000 people there. And he yeah. said, but Matt, he said, not only the 10,000 people there. It's all online as well. Yeah, approximately 90,000. 90, so that's it. He said she had an audience easily of 100,000 people that she spoke to. And so, is so accomplished in that space. She, mm. she speaks like a professional person, just like Sam would be. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly right. No, he was impressed with her. And then we had Dennis Crimmins was our Senior Citizen of the Year. Right. Mia Richardson was our Young Citizen of the Year. Erifili Davis received our Cultural Person of the Year. Now, Daniel Barber got our Sports Person of the Year. He wasn't there, unfortunately. Surprise, surprise, he's away competing at the moment. He's right. a cyclist. Yes. But his mum came forward. And I did say on the day that it's quite appropriate that a parent picks up an award for their mm. sports person mm. child yep. because you can imagine how much effort is put in by parents in getting those kids to training events, to mm. actual competing mm. events, paying for equipment, all sorts of things. So I mm. thought it was quite appropriate that Joe came and picked it up. Great names there, like young Mia Richardson, for example. Like She's a great little kid as well. Mm. Again, almost following in the footsteps of Molly Croft from the point of view of, of some of the stuff that she's already engaging in. It's just wonderful and so inspiring to see these kids getting out there, contributing to community, and not just in Dubbo community, but a much wider community than this as well. Yeah, now you're spot on there. Ella Penman won the Young Sports Person of the Year, and she just keeps going from strength to strength. Fantastic. And the other one was Services to Sport. Mel Pocknell won that yes. for his work in photography. Oh, and yeah. again, I know when the committee was talking about who's made the greatest contribution yeah. to sport, they said, well, one of the great things about Mel and his photography mm. is that that sharing that sport with so many other people as well. Mm. So mm. they were the various winners of those different awards there. Mm. But again, an uplifting experience mm. and just talking to people afterwards, it's just great to feel good yeah. about Dubbo, about Australia. Mm. And I did mm. talk about that in, in my particular delivery, I did talk about the fact that you think about Dubbo or you think about Australia, you think about being Australian, being in this nation, isn't that fantastic, mm. isn't that wonderful? Mm. But Dubbo is a microcosm of mm. Australia. And so feel good about yourselves. And I told the story about the fact that during the week, I was thinking about what I would say on Australia Day, mm. and I ran into some French tourists. And I just happened to be talking to them, what are you doing here? Why are you here? A whole range of things. And I had in the back of my mind, and I did say this to them, that many people think that France is a wonderful country to visit, go and visit Paris, it's a romantic city, it's a beautiful place. Mm. And where I ran into these particular tourists was down on Tracarali. And they said, what do you mean people want to go to France? They said, look at this beautiful river, this right? clean river, look at this riverbank, look at this landscape, people are so friendly. He said, why would anyone want to leave here and go to France? He said, <laughs> once, right? once we go back home and two people about Dubbo, he said, yep. we'll have all sorts of people coming over from France to Dubbo. And so I talked about that a little bit in my delivery, yeah. just saying to people, Sometimes just sit back and reflect mm. on what we've got because mm. what we've got in this nation is pretty special, but what mm. we've got in this city mm. is pretty special as well. And so that was the request I had of everyone in the audience is mm. go home and just think about, gee, yeah. it's not a bad place. Is absolutely, Dubbo. absolutely. Can I give you one more example of a citizen who I only found out this morning who uh, has been acknowledged through the awards? Do you know Ellie Stanmore? 
Yeah, yeah. She yeah. got an OAM, mm. which was just incredible. Another wonderful Dubbo citizen who has just been contributing enormously to uh, to everything that has made our city such a wonderful place over the last, well, pretty much a lifetime for Ellie and her husband as well when he was alive as well. Just a brilliant family. Yeah, so I ran into Jeff Stanmore at Australia Day on Friday. Oh, you saw Jeff? He came back. Lovely. Yeah, and yeah. I saw Jeff and, and I went to school with Jeff, so I had a quick chat to him. Fabulous. And he said... Why he was back, he, he, I thought he might have been back just to see me do Australia mm. Day, but apparently that wasn't enough. Yeah. And so he said his mum was getting an OAM. So we had three OAMs from the Dubbo Regional oh, Council three? area. Oh, three? Wow. So uh, thank you for reminding me. So we should mention those three. So yeah. Ellie Stanmore, obviously, and she was there in the crowd, which is always special oh, when you've got someone there in the crowd that's received one. But we also had Sue Ellen Lovett yes. and Dr. Yeah. Robert North. Oh, so brilliant. they both received an OAM as well. Yeah. So it's nice to acknowledge those people. They didn't win the mm. local awards, but winning an OAM is oh, uh, that's massive, isn't pretty it? nice as well. Oh, congratulations to everybody who received awards there during the course of the Australia Day ceremonies. Now, speaking of uh, what makes the city great... During the course of the week, uh, we had uh, some state car- well, had a state carnival come and uh, go through the town. That was the under-15 girls state cricket carnival. Now, most mornings I've been getting out going for a walk down by the riverbanks there, and my good wife actually has been joining me over the course of the break, which has been lovely as well, and she's been really enjoying it too. The wonderful thing is when you're going past those riverbank ovals and you're seeing all of these cars there and you're seeing all the kids out there playing cricket and you're thinking, well, wait, they're not just there socially, they're here for a competition. I just love that about Dubbo when we have these events come to town. So tell us about this under-15 carnival. How many kids and families did we come in for this one? Well, I did actually talk to Nick Bills from Cricket New South Wales about exactly that. When I went down, I did a coin toss during the week. Uh, on Tuesday morning, I did a coin toss down there and I talked to him about the cricket in general. Mm. We talk about the number of teams and the number of people that come along. And because they're juniors, obviously someone's got to bring them. Yes, bring the then families. Obviously, they sometimes say, well, I've got to come along with the other siblings or I've got mum and dad to come along. Mm. So you might end up with several people per player. Mm. We did a quick calculation and we estimated it probably brought 500 people to the city. That's fabulous. For the week. That's great. Now, we've seen due, during basically the whole Christmas holidays from December, I remember doing coin toss sometime in December. Yep. It seems like uh, from December on tossing coins all through the mouth. That's, that's, that's right. <laughs> so it seems like we've got lots of different events and lots of mm. different cricket carnivals. Cricket New South Wales loves coming to Dubbo and – Actually, Nick did a little video where he actually volunteered and said, can I do a little video just to say how wonderful it is to be in Dubbo and how wonderful the staff are. And so mm. we did that and we posted that video and, and thanks very much for that, Nick. But they just talk about our staff, our grounds, the helpfulness. They just talk about that in glowing terms. Mm. And I'm sure they run different cricket carnivals around the state, different areas, and they've got to deal with different staff members, different people, different Mm. councils, Mm. but they just find ours incredibly helpful. And what that means for us, by being very positive in that respect, is that when they're looking for places to have more carnivals, different carnivals, different events, larger events, then they know they're going to get a great outcome from Dubbo. They also love how many turf pitches we've got, how close they are all together, so they can get from event to event quite easily. Well, the expansion of that entire Riverbank area, you know, the last few years to allow for more pitches to come in too, like it's a brilliant spot now for state carnivals. Yeah, you've got those ones down Lady Cutler, which you mentioned there, you've got number one, two and three. So there are a number of places they can play cricket and they can run those carnivals. Mm. So that was fantastic. And they were basically here all week. I think they finished by Australia Day, so they basically were here Monday to Thursday, Mm -hmm. playing across those days. You can imagine that once people were in town that long, they might have done a little bit of tourism, maybe games finished a bit early, so they Mm -hmm. got away and went out to the zoo or went out to one of our various attractions. And then potentially they were here and went, well, it's a long weekend now, we'll almost stay another day. Mm -hmm. School doesn't start until next week, so we'll stay here for another day or two. So it's not just the ones that we can calculate, there's certainly ones on top of that that will go past the time frame of when the actual event is on. So... Well done to all of our staff, yeah. but it is great to see those different competitions in Dubbo. Oh, absolutely. Now, speaking of competitions and championships and all those sort of wonderful things, girls' rugby. Now, during the course of the week, uh, they started their little rugby championships here and up there uh, uh, in town. And there was the, let's looking through here, we had the New South Wales Waratahs women's team came up and also offered some coaching clinics. So... Again, here's another example of uh, people coming into our, our wonderful town and using our wonderful facilities and running these championships. So talk us through this one. This is another female 
based uh, championship. And this is involved the New South Wales Waratahs. So I'm assuming another successful event would have been held. Uh, absolutely right. And it's still being held today as we speak. Super Rugby Women's is obviously uh, kicking off and, mm. and you know, will be fantastic. And so on the back of that, you've got mm. the female team for the Waratahs. And they've had, I don't know if they've had the whole team out here, but they've certainly had some of the team out running some clinics during the week, running some school holiday type clinics right. and just basically taking girls through their paces. And isn't it also a sign them? of the fact the expansion of women's sport too, isn't it? Which is wonderful, like across the board. Yeah. I don't ever recall ever having a, a New South Wales women's Waratah team come out here to offer coaching clinics, which means, of course, there must be a large enough contingent of kids out here to warrant a coaching clinic too. Yeah, that's right. And obviously they're trying to look for more players. They want to mm. encourage more people to play rugby. They've also got a new competition. This is the first year they've run it which I'd probably call a, a zone competition, zone championships. Mm. I went up and saw some of the girls on Friday night at Apex. So it's an under-16 female rugby competition. Right. And went up there. And, and so basically they played games on Friday and Saturday. And then this morning on Sunday morning, they're just finishing off. I nice think warm might, time to be playing rugby though, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. 40-40, <laughs> 41. On Friday night when I went up there, I went, oh, gee, it's a bit, yeah. a bit hot there. I mean, obviously they're playing late in the afternoon, but it's still mm. pretty warm yeah, there. Yeah, absolutely. But you're right, it is exciting. And one of the things that, that – there was two gentlemen from New South Wales Rugby I spoke with, Angus MacDonald and Peter Murphy, mm. and Peter in particular was just raving about how wonderful it is to come and hold these events in Dubbo and how our staff are bending over backwards to make sure everything's accommodated mm-hmm. and everything's done correctly for them. So our our staff do a really good job there. Yep. But when these various organisations have these experiences and they talk amongst themselves and mm. they keep talking about good outcomes and things happening quite well, then mm. people say, well, we need to do something. We should go out there as well. Mm. You've also got rugby uh, in the old Dubbo City Bowling Club, yes. the one at Windy Warrior Street, which – was one that's the complicated process where we leased that to the women right. to expression yes. of interest, yep. and that was at the end of 2022. Women had an expression of interest. Yep. Rugby were the best bidder for that, so they won that. Of course, we don't have control of that anymore because mm. that whole deal has been rescinded. Mm. But, the but that's RSL, that Waratah's uh, Centre of Excellence uh, group that's there, isn't it? Yeah, they've got basically. I'm not sure if they're calling it Centre of Excellence mm. yet, but they've got a, a rugby base there. Mm. We will see at some point in time when the sports precinct out near Charles Sturt University gets up and running, mm. and that's a lot of money being spent by the state government on that, and there's a long way to go to get all that built. But once that's done, that's probably their long-term plan to be out around that mm. area, mm. and that might be a centre of excellence then. Mm. But at this stage, still, we've got a good presence here with rugby, and that means that when they want to run an event, they've got Dubbo as a good base to come to. So, again, probably not as many players. I don't know the exact number of players and supporters mm. and spectators with that particular one, but probably not as many as a cricket, but still good. And... It's Dubbo's bread and butter. Oh, it is. We just keep ticking over sporting yeah. events and conferences, and we don't need to have an event every day that's got 7,000 people no. like the New South Wales Touch will have with the Junior State Cup. Well, let me sort of tell you about that in regards to I was down there doing the park run there last uh, Saturday, and I was talking uh, to this lady, who, and her son was there, who plays will be playing in the Touch football competition coming up. And... They were so glowing in regards to what happened last year and, and, and the involvement of the Dubbo City Council, the staff there in getting things going, to the point where they said, look, uh, so many people we spoke to last year were preempting the fact that Dubbo was going to win the bid. So they already booked in accommodation, <laughs> knowing full well the fact that, that it was so well run, it was so brilliantly done. And to me, it's just another example of the fact that sport, you keep having these competitions in town here like this sort of thing. The staff doing such a wonderful job. Administrators from different sports are obviously talking to each other. You know, you know, you've got kids who played sport. You know, we cross over and play many different sports. You're going to be talking to administrators in these areas and saying, you know what, we're going to hold the state championships. Well, I was over there, you know, six months ago. and We are over there with the rugby. I think that's a fabulous place to go and run our touch football. So they're obviously communicating because we're doing such a wonderful job. Well, there's three or four examples of why we should be a, a, one of those great spots for so many of these sporting areas to come to. And we'd still like to have major events here, like an NRL game. We've had some NRL games before. Yeah. But when you start to analyse it, if you break it down, the going rate, as we've talked about before, is probably $350,000 approximately mm. to pay to an NRL team to come and play a game in Dubbo. Now, if you play an afternoon match, you'll get people in Dubbo going and attend that match. That's yep. great. And you'll get some people from around the region who will probably travel in for it. But let's say you're playing a match in the afternoon and you live an hour or two away from Dubbo. Yeah. You'll travel into Dubbo. You might go and 
fill up some petrol or you might have something to eat at lunch. Mm. Then you go and watch the game. And then at the end of the game, you probably jump in your car and you'll drive back home. Yeah. You haven't done a lot for the economy. It's good exposure. Don't get me wrong. I still think it's good to have those type of events and those mm. games. But if you want to see a difference made in your community, in your economy, mm. when you have a four-day cricket carnival, for example, that's got 500 people yep. that are staying overnight every night, that are buying their three meals a day, that that's are right. obviously that's buying it. petrol, going and visiting tourist attractions, it does a lot more for our economy oh, absolutely. than something like an NRL yeah, game. Yeah. Totally but, agree. Again, I'd like to have it all, yeah. but if you had to choose one or the other, these ongoing events, and an NRL game, for example, is one day. It might mm. be a couple of days where people might come along if, if they do do that but these other ones are throughout the year there's all mm. sorts of different events whether it be rugby whether it be cricket a whole range of different events they keep ticking over in our economy absolutely now we've spoken at length uh, on a number of occasions in regards to the the precinct out there near the the airport and this is a, a wonderful precinct where there's there's so many great operations out there and one of them right now of course is the the vra um, I see the fact you had a chance to have a talk to Brenton Charlton, who's the Commissioner of VRA, and it looks as though he's got some plans here in regards to continuing to expand this precinct. So what sort of ideas are you thinking about? Well, it's not so much my ideas, it's or Brenton's well, he ideas. Yeah. He wants council to be helping with this process. Yeah. And I would call it the Emergency Services Precinct at the airport mm. now. You've got the RFS Training Centre. You've got the Aviation Centre of Excellence. You've got a police training facility, which hasn't been finished yet. Yep. You've got another RFS headquarters there. You've got SES there. There's not a lot of presence out there from the VRA at the moment. That's right. what Brenton wants to do, and to change that. And so we've had some discussions. Now, typically with these different emergency services operators, what we do from a council perspective is we'll have some discussions. We'll help them with maybe some of their planning where they might go. We don't like to spend our money on these things, though, because mm. the state government should be funding these. In fact, money from councils often go to help fund these, but the mm. state government then formally funds them. But we want to be as helpful as possible because these things are all good for Dubbo. Mm. And if I look mm. at something like the RFS Training Centre there, there are 124 beds out there where people come through on a constant basis, that are doing training at these various yeah. facilities that we've got there. I remember you actually stating a number of times that it's constantly booked out this place. Booked out, that's exactly yeah. right. And so when the police training facility is finished, one of the problems I'll have is enough accommodation, which is fine. They'll come into Dubbo and mm. stay in Dubbo. They might need to build more accommodation out mm. there. Mm. But where Brenton sees this going is that he wants somewhere that you've got as a training centre for VRA. And it'll be quite an interesting training centre. There'd be a number of obstacle course type events or areas that right. I would say it. Yeah. There's probably a more technical name for it, but it did look like a bit of an obstacle course from that planning like around the area. connected area. up to rescue type scenarios. Exactly right. Yeah. And then maybe a small tower that you build there. You've got to be careful of the airport with height limitations, but a small tower <laughs> yep. to do things like training for rescues in the Blue Mountains mm. when you've got to go on abseil okay. down to get to someone, for example. Yep. And the training we talked about with the RFS Aviation Centre of Excellence, mm. you can do the training at low heights where if you make a mistake, you fall down and you mm. sprain your ankle at worst. When you get to the real world, you want to have done that training so many times mm. that it just becomes natural. Because mm. if you do the training in the Blue Mountains and you do make a mistake, then it's not just mm. a little sprained ankle. No, that's, that's right. You're result. falling at a reasonable height. That's mm. it. That's right. So they're the type of things that we're talking about here. Now, how council will be involved, again, some of that initial planning, then council owns all that land out there. We're not going to give land away. We're not going to even sell that land out around the airport because we might need that for 20, 30, mm. 50 years' time for airport expansion. Typically, what we'll do with these operators is we'll lease land. So mm. if you want a private hangar, we'd lease land to you. You go and put a hangar on there. You know there is a, a risk, a very small risk, mm. that at the end of that lease, council says, sorry, we're not going to give you a new lease. And mm. that building, sure, you can take it away. It's your building, but it's on concrete and it's built. So mm. you, you're probably not going to go to the expense of taking it away. Yeah. The reality is, unless council's got a good reason, they're not going to not renew someone's lease. Yeah. And again, with these emergency services operators, typically we'll say, yep, you can lease that land. What's the parcel you need? The mm. difference for the emergency services operators, if we can see that they're making a contribution to Dubbo with that constant people coming through, we can see they're providing a service, i.e. emergency services, then we'll typically lease that land at a peppercorn rate. Now, I right. can't say that's the case for the VRA. Like yet. a nominal rate sort of thing. Yeah, nominal rate, yeah. maybe a dollar yeah. a year type of thing. Yeah. We, we, I can't say for the VRA we'll do that because we don't have a council resolution. Yep. I know for 
other areas out there. That's typically what we've done. Mm. And that would be the approach from the VRA and the discussions that I've been having with the VRA is that, yes, we would probably do that, but we've got to wait to a council resolution to actually hey, go tell that me, far. Do they, um, the different type of organisation and groups out there, do they communicate with each other and do they use each other's facilities? Is that part of what they do? Well, it's interesting because that was one of the big things that Brenton is a big fan of is mm. to make sure that all the different operators work together. And yes, I would say definitely. I'm sure there are times when you get a little bit of um, protectionism. Mm. Maybe one of the groups says, oh no, this is ours and we've paid for this and we've mm. got the money for it and, and leave it alone. Mm. But in general, I think the attitude is we're all here to serve the community. Mm. And one perfect example is out there at the moment, you've got this building that we've spoken about before that is a a fake smoke building. In other words, you've got a, a building out there that is an area that you can fill up with smoke that's not proper smoke that mm. you can get in. It restricts your vision. They've got fake fires in the building. Yep. So you can go in and train firefighters to actually go in and fight a fire in this building that's full of smoke. So you put on all your breathing apparatus and away you go. So I remember being out there at the opening and I found it quite fascinating, the technology that was yeah, in there quite yeah. fascinating. Now that facility really is open to the normal fireys, the RFS, VRA might want to do oh, some training fantastic. there. Yeah, the yeah. police might want to do some training in there. So yep. you've got a range of different emergency services that can well, be used. you can see there. how this obstacle course will link in with that as well. Yeah, some of the things yeah. you're talking and about, I could see these other groups doing it. And I've got to be careful saying obstacle course. I'm sure Brent would be horrified hearing <laughs> obstacle course. I'm sure there's a, a more technical name for the type of training there. But yes, the uh, specific, um, you know, uh, I don't know what you could refer to it as. But anyway, we'll refer to it as an obstacle course for the sake of what we're talking about <laughs> today. Right. People can sort of picture it out themselves. But uh, the, the exciting part is that You've got all these different facilities there. People are coming in to Dubbo experiencing that. Yes. And, of course, they're hearing about Dubbo at the same time, just knowing that we exist, coming here. And then mm. they might say, well, we're here doing some training, but my training finishes on Friday. Well, I might stay the weekend. And, mm. gee, just right there near where we're at, we've got the Royal Flying Doctor Service Visitor Experience Centre. Yep. I've got the jail. I've got the zoo. A whole range of things. So they might stay. And that all, oh, that keeps ticking Absolutely. over in our economy. It's another reason to come to the city, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Mm. So I'm really impressed with Brenton, and I think he's a bit of a go-getter. He's only mm. fairly new in the role of commissioner. Good on him. But I, I think there'll be some action happening there. And again, once we agree on a parcel of land and we get something formal and go through council so he's got a resolution mm. there, then that'll be the, the next job for him to go and get the money from the state government yeah. to build these essential facilities. Yeah, I look forward to see how the obstacle course goes. Now, during the week, uh, you also had the chance uh, to talk to the 7.30 report. Um, one of the reporters uh, has obviously been in contact with you to talk about what appears to be some discussion over the renewable energy zone. Was this a bit of a follow-up from what happened the, the past week before that when you caught up with um, some of the representatives there, like uh, Twiggy Forrester and these sort of guys? Yeah, so I think there's a lot of interest in renewables across the nation at the mm -hmm. moment. And I think having someone like 7.30 Report, obviously a, a national news organisation there with the ABC, yeah. having someone like that come along and talk about this, there's a fascination across the, the, the whole nation. Mm. But also I think people are interested in seeing how it's affecting people on the ground, getting mm. that local perspective on there. So mm. 7.30 rang me and said, we're coming out to Dubbo, we're going to do some stories around renewables, can we talk to you about it? And of course I said, yes, I'm happy to talk about it. And it's interesting because there's a whole range of different aspects of that. And some of the questions were about renewables and people's attitude towards renewables in general. But it, it was also a bit of a discussion about Energy Co and the impact Energy Co is having. Mm. And I actually, the answer I gave around that in particular was really the two separate parts that we are seeing from a council perspective. We've got 37 projects that will either already started, already in operation or in planning or at different stages. And not all 37 might go ahead, but assuming all 37 go ahead, we'll be providing about 42% of the power for the entire state. Now, we're seeing that, and we're seeing the investment in that, and generally most people in our LGA are pretty positive about all of that. Yep. They think it's a good thing. They're seeing some money flow into the community. They're seeing some changes happening. That's all fantastic. Mm. But keep in mind the essential difference, which I'll get to in a moment, the essential difference here is that people that have those wind turbines or solar panels or batteries on their farm – choose to do it, and they mm. choose to do it typically because they're getting paid some sort of form of compensation for it, some sort of reasonable form of compensation for it, but also they might have some belief that it's good for the planet, but again, they're being paid for it. But mm. if someone comes along and says, I want to put a wind turbine on your property, you can say, no, mm. I don't want you to do that, go and do it next door, and some of the proponents will go and do that where the landholders say yes. You've got a separate part, and one of the questions from the ABC mm. was, 
Energy Co., who are building the transmission lines. Now, keep in mind that in the past, most of the power has been generated on the coast, mm. and then that power goes up and down the coast. Yep. Because we're generating more power out here, we need better transmission lines to be able to take that power from here back to the coast. Now, transmission lines have been built ever since electricity started yep. being oh, distributed. absolutely, yeah. yeah. So Same it's not as if this is a renewables only focus. Yes. When you had power generated by coal-fired power stations, you still had to get the power mm. to where you needed it. Mm. It wasn't magical, it's in the air and it's done. Nikola Tesla had an idea about doing that, yep. never quite got it to work. Yep. So in essence, the transmission lines are just a way of getting that power, however it's generated from point A to point B. Yep. We don't have a lot of people at this stage that are impacted by Energy Co. Mm. But the big difference here is that when Energy Co. say, I need to go from point A to point B to get that power from where it's generated to where it's needed, and here's the most cost-effective route to go, mm. and then they knock on your door and they say, Mr. Barnes, we need to take some transmission lines to your property. At the end of it all, you can't say no. Right. They've got compulsory powers, which yep. makes sense. Yep. If you had the ability to say no, they could build a transmission line and then there's a gap in the middle. Mm. What do you do mm. around that gap? Mm. Well, well can, they're not going to sort of do some big dog leg sort of thing with a big energy system. Like that's that, right. They? It so, costs yeah. money to put up these transmission yeah. lines. So I did say that we're seeing mostly positive news from the renewables, the money mm. that's coming in, et cetera. But when you go between our area, our renewable energy zone, and the power back down across to the coast where they'll be taking that power mm. to, there are probably some of the farmers that are impacted that aren't happy about it, and they'd like to say no, but they aren't able to say no. Okay. So it's an interesting little pick-up. I, I was reading there in the paper this morning, having my morning coffee and sitting down reading it. And this really, uh, well, I suppose, shocked me from the point of view of just how quickly this is all moving. Right now, the, the statement has been made there that uh, from the point of view of energy sources, and I didn't realise this, but renewable energy already makes up 43% of the energy source that we're actually accessing right now. 43%. Is that in this nation? Yeah, that's it. That, that seems larger than I would have guessed. And I, I've this is coming re- from the Herald there this morning, so yeah, I'm assuming it's correct. Yeah. And I did some research on that probably a year or so ago, and, and renewables made up a fairly small proportion of our mm. overall amount. But obviously, if it's at 43%, which, yeah, I'm the same as you, it does seem like a, yeah, a high figure. Yeah, really high. If it's 43% already, then there's been some fairly good progress that's been made. But they reckon it's moving probably five years in front of where they're expecting it to be. Yeah, okay. Well, that's all good news. Yeah, yeah. But it's interesting, though, when people complain about renewables, some people aren't happy about renewables, mm. the fact that when they turn their lights on, there's mm. a potential that some of that power is being generated by renewables as we speak. Now, I know on my electricity bill, I, I tick the box or I use a provider that gives me green energy. So yeah. there are people out there, and I know it counts as well when we've got our different contracts. We're using our small sites contract is all renewables, 100% renewables. Yep. Our large site contracts, we've got a, a stepping process to get to that stage. Yep. But some of that has been driven by people like me who want to tick the box to yeah. say, I want green power. And I think a big part of it is, is solar. People's own solar seems to be one of the big areas they're talking about too. You know, the, their own solar, solar energy panels they've got set up in there. Yep. They're also saying here that they're expecting uh, by the June quarter when they sort of come up next that the wholesale energy price is going to drop significantly because of now the accelerated input of these renewable energies. And it's something that certainly Chris Bowen, when we were at that Ungla Wind Farm opening and Twiggy Forest spoke about, mm. the cheapest way to produce power is renewables. And it mm. makes sense. It does. You build it, yes, that costs money. But yep. once it's built, it's very minimal maintenance, yep. very low cost for it to keep producing electricity, whereas a coal-fired power station, you've got to keep shoveling coal in, and yep. that costs money. Well, the federal government's expecting to be up to 80% of renewable energies. Is it by the end of 2025, by the end of 2030? What's their... I think 2030 is their target for yep. that, and uh, I can't remember the exact figure in terms of the percentage mm. there, but 2030 is certainly, and again, Chris Bowen spoke about that, that mm. we've got a target to hit by 2030. We've got to keep it ticking yeah, away. Yeah. And that's good for us because we're getting projects around us, Absolutely. lots of money being injected. And again, this is the potential with things like the React Centre, yeah. things like these renewables, the potential to transform Wellington in particular. Absolutely. And, and it's, it's happening right now, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely right. Now, speaking of things that are happening right now, uh, Alcan, which is, uh, they're a a major company, and it looks as though out near Badangra, they're doing some digging or some drilling there looking for gold. Is this like the old, the gold rush days? uh, (laughs) I didn't realise we had such a big gold rush area around our area here. Well, we've certainly got gold there, and I don't know they're so much looking for gold. They know Mm. it's there. And just to go back one step, Alcan is the same company that's got the 
gold mine across towards parts at Tom Ingley there. Mm-hmm. And yep. one of the things that I found fascinating about that place, one day I went for a tour around there and they had gold deposits along one side of the highway that they were working on. They were mining all that area. And they found some gold across the other side of the highway. This is the Newell Highway we're talking yeah, about. Yep. So they just said, well, we'll just dig a hole underneath it. Now, they get approvals for it, of course, mm, but mm. you're driving around and then you drive along and there's the Newell Highway and you just go underneath the tunnel that goes underneath <laughs> the Newell Highway and out there's side, there's the next part of the mine. Yep. There, and again, this is outside of LGA, but just yeah. to give you an idea of, of some of the mining processes, they mm. found more gold down further along the Newell, but unfortunately some of that gold is under the Newell Highway. Right. So they're moving the Newell Highway. Is that right? So they've had to buy properties, buy land, go through, and they'll actually be moving the Newell Highway. There must be so plenty of mine. gold there to want to do that. Exactly right. But it gives you an idea of the scale and the scope yeah. of some of these mining companies. Yeah. Now, there is gold around the Wellington area. We know that from a there long time ago. There is gold in them dare hills. <laughs> there is exactly right. And the, obviously, things change. Mm. Prices of things you dig out of the ground change. And sometimes mm. we've seen it in Cobar before where mines will shut down when prices drop down a bit and when those particular products they can mine, when prices are high for those, they might open up those mines and start mining again. Mm. So prices change, but also technology, mining technology has changed quite dramatically. And if you go to Lightning Ridge any time and look at one of their, or there's only one, the mining museum there, mm. it's quite fascinating seeing some of the old ways they used to do some uh, mining. Compared pickaxe to some of the and away ways. they'd go. That's it, digging well, things, away. Things like belts hooked up to cars, hooking up to wheels of cars to then <laughs> spin different It's things. quite ingenious when you think about it, what <laughs> it they is, did. Actually. Yeah, yeah. So, so they progress. So when you get a, a major company like Alcane, when they've got modern mining methods, which are much more efficient than older mining methods, yep. and when they've got the ability to look at geology in much greater detail than mm. ever before, areas that they might think weren't viable at some stage in the past, might now be viable. So we know there's gold, and this is around the Coomabella Bedangra area down around Wellington. Mm -hmm. We know there's gold there, but is it enough? Will you have enough concentration? Mm. Is it easy enough to get to that you can make money out of Mm. it? Because obviously a gold mine is not going to become a gold mine unless you can make money. that's right. So over the next two months, you'll see potentially, if you're out around that area, Mm. you'll see some people doing some core samples. And essentially, they've got the geology at one level, right. and then they go and do a number of core samples where they're basically looking at what is at different levels as you go down okay. through the ground, yep. and then the geologists can look at all that, extrapolate that information, use other information they've got available to them, mm. and determine the concentration of gold, the vein that the gold might go in, yep. and then make some decisions about whether or not you go ahead. Mm. What's interesting about this is that we made, we, we had a report come back to council mm. where it estimated up to 6,000 new employees would be needed for Dubbo over the next five years for a range of our activities, mainly focused around renewable energy. Mm, mm. But when you start to think about the Toongai yep. mine, which, again, is done by an offshoot of yep. alkane. But when well, you the more about, traditional styles of mining, too, is more labour-intensive than the, probably the current uh, renewable energy-type projects, too, from the long-term perspective. Yeah, that's exactly right. But yep. when you think about the Toongai mine, which hopefully they get up and going at some stage in the near future, mm. then you talk about maybe a gold mine around Kumabella Badengra, then you start to think about the renewables on top of that, mm. the amount of people we're going to have come into our area over the next 5 to 15 years yes. is quite incredible. So if you are in that area, you might see some core assembly done. You know what it's all yeah. about now. So go and take your pan and see if you can get a little bit of gold as well. <laughs> Good luck. Co-chairing. Uh, this is a fairly common practice within... Um, I suppose, the aviation industry. And is there an opportunity here maybe for some code sharing to take place between uh, what looks like Link Airways and Virgin? Is this this something that's being talked about here? Well, I had uh, some phone calls, Mm. uh, many phone calls and and requests for interviews because the code share announcement came out and it was about Link Airways and Virgin. Mm. But some of the media misunderstood that and thought that Virgin was going to start flying to Dubbo. Right, Which yes. would be big news. And yeah, I've met... We'd with, all be happy for that. That's fine, yes. We would be. I've met with Virgin several times, actually, mm. to try and convince them to come to Dubbo. The problem that Virgin has about coming to Dubbo is that the first route they want, any airline wants, mm. is Dubbo to Sydney. Mm. It's a well-travelled route. There is a, a number of people that travel between Dubbo and Sydney. The, the numbers are fantastic. So mm. they want a piece of that action. But, of course, you've got the slots or the lack of availability of slots at Sydney Airport. Mm. So as much as you might want to do that, as much as we might want to do that, mm. do that, we don't control the slots, unfortunately. Mm. I'd love to control the slots down there. So Virgin would love to be here. Do you think that might change when Battery Creek comes online? 
Well, it's interesting. The, the Western Sydney Airport obviously will be an area that will have potential to have more flights. And yes, I think that's right. Mm. And there's a fine line there. We as a council and many regional councils are in the same situation. We want to make sure we maintain access to Sydney Airport. Mm. We don't want them to say, all those regional airports, yep. now you just fly into the Western Sydney Airport. Yep. Because there are times you might want residents from here to fly into Sydney Airport rather than Western Sydney mm. Airport. Mm. So, yes, I think it will change, but we also want to make sure we don't get completely pushed out yep. to Western Sydney. Yep. So all that's fine, but the stories about Virgin coming, not quite accurate. The number of flights we've got will not change. Link Airways, Link Airways already fly to Melbourne and already fly to Brisbane. Mm. That's fantastic. What has changed is the code sharing arrangements between Link and Virgin. So now if I was going to fly somewhere using Virgin, an, an actual Virgin aircraft, where I might be going from, say, Brisbane or from Melbourne to somewhere else, yep. I don't know, pick somewhere like Townsville, yep. then in the past I could have flown to Brisbane via Link Airways yep. and then got my bag off and then got on the Virgin flight and then flying from Brisbane to, to Townsville. Mm. And I have two separate tickets and I have to track all those, mm. etc. Code sharing means that I could now buy tickets through one company. I could go yep. on the Virgin website logically. I'd buy the ticket from Dubbo to Townsville yep. and I would be on a Link Airways flight for the first part and I'd be on a Virgin flight for the next part. Mm. But it's one ticket. Now, yep. that doesn't sound like that good a deal. It's better. I still think it's an improvement. From a passionist perspective, though, I think it's a great idea. Well, I think that's right. I think it is making it a bit easier for customers Mm. to travel. But also what I like about it is it means that Virgin, who, again, we've had discussions with Mm. before, who aren't flying here, Virgin are a bit more aware of Mm. Dubbo. They can see they put their toe in the door. Well, a little bit. Yeah, that's right. A little bit of a toe sort of starting to appear here. Get a bit of a feel around for it. Yep. mm. And they then will see better numbers as Mm. they come through. So they'll get a really good gauge on those numbers. So I think... It's good news. It's not as exciting as Virgin adding flights to Dubbo, but it's still good news Mm. in general. It's a start, isn't it? It is a start. That's right. Ah, the Fowler steam engine. Now, this is located down there in Wellington, this this wonderful steam engine, which uh, was built way back in 1912, apparently. Um, now, it, it comes out when they, they have their, their big parade down there for uh, their festival that they run in Wellington. Um, but I'm not quite sure if it's doing anything else right now, the Fowler Steam Engine. Is, is this creating a bit of a problem because of that front for Dubbo Regional Council? It is creating a bit of a problem that we need to solve. Mm. And it's is, been discussed. Is, is it costly just to keep it like that? It, it's costly just to keep it full stop. Mm. If we want to use it, it's more costly. And this is the big discussion. So at the moment, it's probably costing council about $20,000 a year mm. to maintain the foul steam engine. Mm. Now, it's been a part of Wellington since the 1920s. It was imported from England. Uh, it was made by John Fowler and Co., as you said correctly, in 1912. Mm. It was imported from Leeds in England in the 1920s okay. for Wellington Council. Yeah, right. So it's been a part of Wellington since then. So you know, more than 100 years history there. A steam road locomotive. And I've sat up in the Fowler steam engine mm. and it is very much a 100-year-old device. But was it device? Was it a working device initially? Absolutely. Yeah, right. Yeah, okay. yes. It was used to basically help do their road works yeah, okay. way back in yep. the 1920s and beyond. Yep. So it's very fondly regarded within mm. Wellington. Just keep having these visions of cars, the film, you know, with the, with the old bitumen sort of layer thing <laughs> puffing along there behind. <laughs> That's right, yeah. <laughs> and so you've got a bit of a problem. Mm. There's a couple of things there. Do you want to keep this heritage item in pristine condition and have it sitting somewhere that people can come along and look at it mm. behind a glass wall? Or do you want to, which is what's happened in the past, do mm. you want to have it out at things like the vintage fair, have people be able to get up on it, have people take it, for rides, not them driving, obviously, mm, but have mm. people be on it. This classic old piece of mm. engineering and machinery from all those years ago. Yeah. What do you want to do Living with it? Living history almost in that sort That's of right. way, isn't it? Yeah. Now, if you use it, if you have it brought out various times throughout the year and you actually use it, A, it's much more expensive, obviously, to keep it operating. Mm. B, you're wearing it out. Mm. Now, does that mean in 30 years' time it's not going to be there anymore? or we have to spend a lot more money on maintaining it. So then do you say, let's just put it somewhere and look at it. Mm. It's much cheaper to keep it, and you're not wearing it out while Which, people are just looking look, at to it. to be frank, there's quite a few examples of exactly that around the nation. Exactly right. Um, is, now, is, is, is a, sorry to interrupt you there, but is, is this something, though, that, that other councils, do they hire it? Do they look at it to use for their other festivals? Is it, a, is it something that can be you know, leased out for other 
events and things like that? Well, it would be an interesting scenario. Yes, it could be. Transport costs to get places would be That's huge. That's right. So it? to, to, it's obviously not going to drive fast enough. If someone <laughs> says, can you can you slip it over to parks I'll for see a, in six a festival? Yeah. It's yeah. a slow old trip that mm. you're going on across to there. So you want to transport it. That costs money. Mm. And then, of course, the more you're using it, the more you're wearing it out. Mm. So you'd want to be charging enough money that you could actually do it rather than just as a nice community event. We're going to charge you enough to make sure we can maintain mm. it. I don't know the answer to these questions. Mm. We've engaged an expert to give us more information and more data. I often talk about the fact that councillors need the data to make decisions. We need accurate data to Mm. make decisions. Once we've got that data, we can make those decisions. It'll probably come to council in April, so the April council meeting, to make some sort of decision about what we do with it. Other Mm. community groups might be out there that might want to take on Mm. the maintenance of it, to store it potentially, the Wellington Museum, for example, might want to have it and have it out the front of the Wellington Museum now that that's on the highway. Mm. A whole range of things. As I said, I don't know the answers. I know that we've got to have a solution for mm. the Fowler steam engine. And I know we owe it to the people of Wellington to come up with a solution that keeps it part of their community in whatever mm. shape or form it is. I'm sure when we get closer and there'll be some more reports that will come out, mm. when we get closer there'll be some discussion around exactly what we're doing. Can I just talk about, about how that discussion may sort of come about? Like uh, for the point of view of the listeners, putting uh, – so they can maybe sit in your shoe for a second in regards to what thoughts and what considerations go through your mind and the minds of other councillors and the committee members who are making the decisions in regards to making a decision on this. Is it just a cost-based situation or is there more to it? And, and what would the more to it look like? It's really, it's a tough one. It's a tough question because when you make decisions at council, I can talk about part of my decision-making process. I can't really get inside the head of every other councillor. And again, Are council there broad categories though? You have to like a little ticker box sort of things in making a decision like this. Do, do we, you know, how, how do we go about getting to this resolution? Yeah. And so one of the things that certainly I would do looking at all of this information is you're looking at the good for the community, the greater good for the community. So it's not just... Mm. One person wants to do something, so you make a decision to do that. You're looking at how does that affect the whole community, and cost does come into it. Mm. If you said we can keep it and use it for everything we want to use it for and there's no risk to the community and it's going to cost nothing, then it would be a pretty easy decision to make. Mm. When it starts to cost money, we've got a limited budget. We can spend money on A, B, or C, not A and B and C. Mm. That's really an important part of that overall process. So for me personally, once we get the information, once we get all these reports in, and some of it's based on what you have in terms of community discussion. Mm. Part of that greater good, you don't want to throw away history, but you don't want to keep history that's costing you too much money when you need to be looking after other things as well. Mm. So this will be a really tough decision when mm. we finally come to make it, whichever way we go. There's going to be some expense involved, mm. and there's going to be maybe some compromise involved. Is, is there a situation in regards to something like this? Is it run by a committee, this, uh, the steam engine, the Fowler steam engine? Is, is, is there a group down there in Wellington that, that maintains, looks after it? Because what I'm leading with this is, is there an opportunity then for this group to maybe apply for a grant? through council that they can then justify to say, well, it's, the cost is $20,000 or whatever, but uh, this group can apply for a grant and they might be able to get $10,000 to keep maintaining the running of this machine. It would be more council would be applying for a grant from someone else, right, the state okay. or federal government yeah. the or other community groups that might be able to give grants for this type of thing. Mm. There wouldn't be much point in Like a heritage group. group or something out there, Heritage New South Wales maybe, something like that. Something like that. It, yeah. it wouldn't be much point in a committee making an application to council because it's still costing mm. the community money. Yep. So it'll be an interesting one, an interesting discussion, and people that are interested, obviously, talk to your fellow council, sorry, to your local councillors, have a discussion with, with myself or anyone that you need to, mm. but it will be based on the report that comes through, and that'll be a public report before a decision is made as well, so people mm. can get a chance to have their say and really put their views forward, mm. which councillors do listen to. I know I do, and I know councillors are very good at listening to the community. You can't always make everyone happy in the community with the decisions you make, mm. but you need to be able to hear all those different points Absolutely. of view. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So yeah. it'll be an interesting one. I don't know yeah. the answer, but it'll be an interesting discussion. An interesting yeah, I'll be very interested to see how it all goes. Mm. There you are. So I mentioned there earlier, I've been out walking most mornings down on the Tracker Riley track around our beautiful river system. Um, and very excited to sort of see the extension of the cement path there coming through, which looks absolutely fantastic, by the way. Um, coming through there quite nicely. So is it finished now, Matt? Is the that whole path extension done, the Tracker Riley extension? Now, 
there's, I'm not sure which one you're talking about here. There's two different paths that you might be talking about. Oh, okay. Let's talk about, uh, okay, while I'm on that one, the cement path first of all then. But you know the cement path section heading down towards Sandy Beach? Yes. That part there. Is that is that almost finished? or? So there's, a, there's an interesting part there. We talked about it previously. We extended that from Tenworth Street, the car park at the end of Tenworth Street. Yep. We extended that around, around a certain point. Mainly to improve my park run yes, times. Yes, we would have to be knocking off at least a half a second off your park run Absolutely. times now, surely. And, and uh, another minor issue was some of the erosion that's happening along the riverbank there yep. to move the path over from where it was mm. and to make it more resilient when we do have flooding mm. along there because the cement path is better. So there's that part of it. Now, our staff were fantastic in the work they did there and they actually had some money left in their budget after they finished that. Mm. So they, they've done the first essential part and they've now extended that, and you'll now notice the path goes past the Sandy Beach yes. bubbler and just down past the, the section, I suppose, near where Park Run would finish there. Yep. Yep. So just the, the part just opposite that. Which is fantastic, because that area normally when it gets wet is muddy and you can't really walk through it. It does get a bit slippery. And it does, certainly yeah. it doesn't take a lot of rain for it to get a little bit slippery there, which some yeah. people have said to me that, that do walk around that area regularly say that, can you do something about that? Mm. This is the solution. And using cement for that path means that when you do get flooding run over there, which it does go under, mm. it's a fairly low part there, it goes under fairly easily, then that means that really the worst you might have to do is wash off a bit of the silt that might get mm. left behind on there. You don't love about that story is the fact that you <laughs> under budget, how often do you ever hear those two words yeah, put together? That, yeah, that's that's normally right. we're over budget to go under budget and then to allow for actual extra extension. That's wonderful. Yeah, that's so that's good. good. And they did it very quickly as well. Oh, yeah. And I know some people have asked me about a couple of different patterns on that pathway. Funny you should mention that because the first time I saw that, I think you're probably looking at me there when I asked you about <laughs> that one. The first time I came across that and I saw this, uh, you know, sort of orangey oxide sort of thing painting over across the, the little section of it and then there's this whole other part that hadn't been touched and I thought, what, what, did, did Joe suddenly go across, paint it up and go, yeah, nah, I, I don't like the way that looks. And then I saw another little section a little bit further down and I saw the same sort of painting done. And I'm thinking, is this a bit of artistic work here? Did they sort of feel as though we can't just have one section painted? Maybe we do two, and all of a sudden looks artistic. So is that the reason why they've done that? Surely there's got to be another reason. Well, I like that story, and I might be you like, like that. You, you can tell I'll, that one. I'll replace the real story with that story. That, <laughs> that was our, our team just being a bit artistic. That's right. But you'll notice where those two red sections are, yes. and they're strategically located. One of those sections is is near a pump station and gives access across to the other side of the path. Ah. So if they had... Uh, and sorry, I'll go where the other section I'll talk about why in a moment. Yep. And the other section is near the toilets at Sandy Beach, which is yes. where the dragon boat is stored as well. Yes, yes. So both of those sections are double meshed and have uh, basically... So they're stronger? They're stronger. They yeah, right. increase strength, those areas. Okay. So that, for example, if they were pulling out the dragon boat and then yep. to back a car up to hook up the dragon boat trailer, then you'd say to the dragon boats, okay, drive across this particular yeah, section here. Yeah. The pump station, they might need to take cars across to the yeah. pump station. But well, that also, makes a lot more sense than my artistic story. <laughs> it does. <laughs> I like your story. Uh, but the other one is they might want to get across the other side of the path for yeah. heavy equipment, for mowers, for vehicles. They might have uh, those sort of mowers on. So Wonderful. Basically, those two are a bit stronger, mm -hmm. and you can take vehicles across them so that because the path is made for people to walk on, to mm. run on, to ride mm. bikes on, it's not really made for vehicles. So sometimes you get, do get a bit of damage. Mm. And if you look across the other side of the river, there, there is some damage. You'll see some black patching that's been done there. Mm. And we had some grass fires along some of those other sections there. So emergency vehicles went along there to address those grass fires, which yep. is fantastic. That's what they yep. do. Yep. But those heavy vehicles, that part there wasn't uh, so designed for heavy the vehicles there, okay. crack the cement so yeah. that's yeah. what it's there for the red one's there for so i'm not sure which is the other part that you might yeah. want to ask me about in a moment yeah. but that's certainly that extension down there to the area just past the bubbler there uh, that's it as far as i know at this stage until we get more money at some stage uh, in the future well i'm looking forward to seeing your park run times improve now there's no excuse Now, speaking of uh, pathways and things like that um, and all those glorious things down by the riverbank because it is looking absolutely stunning down there right now, especially all the green and the lushness of it. But the shared pathway uh, that's there behind Ollie Robbins Oval and that sort of section which is happening, I had a bit of a look at that the other day. Boy, oh boy, that's looking pretty special. It is looking very good. We had mm. an inspection there. Councils were lucky enough to have an inspection there along the, the pathway, and then a couple of little viewing platforms, including yeah. the main one, which is they a... They look awesome. Yeah, and the, the main one's a cantilever platform, so you're standing out over above the riverbank there. Yeah. Now, 
those sections that are there, those various sections where you can go and stop and have a bit of lunch or mm. sit around and just admire the beauty there, mm. those sections have got the screw pile on. So you might remember we talked yes. about those before. Yeah. We've got some underground um, photography, is not the right mm. word, but underground mm. scanning done. I was looking for the root systems, wasn't it? Those Correct. big red gums and things. There. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and so it was determined that the best way to put pilings in the ground there was not to drill out and put some in there or not to mm. – drive them in like it's happening with the bridge at the moment, mm, the, the mm. new Dubbo Bridge, but screw pylons where you literally screw it in and when it gets to a certain amount of pressure on that for a certain amount of time, mm. then it's determined that's strong enough. So you might see them if anyone walked or, or drove past there. Mm. They might have seen the pylons coming out of different angles and that yeah. was to avoid some of those roots and still get it basically mm. in the ground and strong enough there. Yeah, the Cecil amazed me, the brilliance of engineers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely right. Now, that area there which is a different colour as well, but that's not the same. <laughs> they didn't the do it for one. artistic reasons either? Or maybe <laughs> no, they did for this right. case, I don't know. Well, <laughs> that whole area there is a shared pathway. Now, yeah. once that's opened up again, if you remember before, there was black bitumen where mm-hmm. cars drove along. Yep. There was a little fence that might have gone up to your knee at most, and then on the other side, that was a skinny crushed mm. granite path, which was track Riley path. Mm. That's all combined as one now. So that road will be an area where cars can go along there slowly, People can walk or run, push bikes can go along there. So it's basically Tracker Riley and that old pathway yeah, all right. combined into one. Yep. When we do that, we'll be saying to people, please, if you drive along here, mm. it is a shared pathway. Don't drive too fast. We'll have yep. a speed limit posted there, obviously. Yep. If it gets to the stage where it's just not working, cars are going along there and they're being silly and it's dangerous for people, yep. we've got the ability to put temporary bollards in. Yeah, right. We don't want to put a permanent construction in mm. because the next part, will be the development of an events precinct. Yeah, now listen, tell me about this, because I read somewhere during the week that this is being brought forward. Well, it's the ability for us to do it now. We mm. had some funding, and the funding had certain projects specifically associated with it. Mm. We wanted to change around some of those projects, still use that same funding and still using it in the same flavour, but just mm. different projects. We had to get permission from the government to do that, because they were giving us the money. We couldn't go and just randomly use it mm. for something else. So we got that permission, happy days. Yep. So now we know that we can go ahead because we've got the money there for the events precinct. Now, this is using that natural flow of land down to Ollie Robbins. So mm. you'll have... Like a, a natural amphitheatre. Yeah, and I wouldn't go as far as the amphitheatre because it's just, it's not big enough to be an yeah. amphitheatre. Yeah. The curvature on there... But you've got a natural think, rising there for a, a natural platform rise. area. Yeah, it? that's right. So we'll build them. The events precinct will be some form of a stage. It'll probably have some form of a covering over yeah, it. Right, okay. The toilets that are there now will be taken away, removed, and yep. there'll be toilets as part of this staging area. Okay. So when you have concerts, when you have rallies, when you have people that want to be in that area there, mm. you'll have that stage there. And I think of different events, for example, the Holy Mellor Festival yes, that yes. was down there. Yes. That was done and used part of the well, site. there's a the number ground. of multicultural festivals I think could really use that now, couldn't there? That's Anyone exactly could yeah, use absolutely. it appropriately there. But that then means that sometimes you might want to get a Pantech truck or heavier vehicles mm-hmm. down there because you've got equipment on there. So we want to be able to have that shared pathway, even if we do put bollards in, mm. if there's an event on, mm. okay, those bollards are out. Early in the morning, you can get in there and do mm. what you've got to do. And then to stop cars driving along all the events on, we'll put the bollards back so in. So is the shared pathway, is, is that a cement base with an oxide through it or something, is it? Or Yeah, and there's actually a really interesting pattern on top there when you oh, do get a chance to have yeah, a look right. at it. Yeah, yeah. It's like they've used some form of screed to basically go along and put some swirl patterns in there. Yeah, right. It actually looks... Quite, quite That'd impressive. That'd be quite labour-intensive doing that. So. It, uh, I think it was, yeah. Talking to <laughs> talking to David Payne, he did make a minor comment that there was a fair bit of work involved right, okay. on hands and knees. I'm sure yeah. not by Payne, but I'm sure by someone else yes, there yes. to do that. But look, that whole area it looks great. The original vision, if you like, from the yeah. last council when that all started, when they received money from the state government, yep. was to do a boardwalk, a boardwalk mm-hmm. out over the river, certainly over the river, maybe over the river there, mm. which I think, would be fantastic. I would mm. love to see a boardwalk mm. down there. Yep. But the boardwalk would cost. It was just not viable to do mm. that with the limited funds that were available from yep. the state government. So this shared pathway is kind of a compromise, if you like. You can still walk along there, stop at the viewing platforms, look out across yeah. the beautiful river there, but not necessarily out. Opening time of this? We're looking still around Easter? or It'll be, it'll be definitely up and running by April. So mm-hmm. sometime before April, we'll yep. have all that up and running there. Easter weekend would be nice. Uh, that's the It'd end be a nice April, opening time, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would be yeah. nice to have it. Big crowd there. in Tubbo as well. It's a big popular time to come here to Dubbo for tourists. Mm. Yeah, so that's progressing well. Yeah. Events precinct will probably go to tender around the March time frame. It'll probably take another year to build after that. Okay.
Now, just a little uh, community service announcement, let's just call it that. Um, Curse Creek Wind Farm looks as though there's a community meeting out at the Eucarina Soldiers Memorial Hall coming up during the week. Uh, it, it, is this for the community to come out and maybe to hear what's happening out there, to maybe to give their chance to express their opinion on what the thoughts are happening? Yeah, there's a few people who have been asking some questions about the Curse Creek Wind Farm. And in essence, the decision was made that the best way to, to communicate that, and it was a request by the community as well, just to have some sort of public meeting, community meeting. So you're spot on, Eucarina Soldiers Memorial Hall on Tuesday, the 30th of January at 6 pm. And come along, ask your questions, come along, find out more information. Yeah. I think that it's great. I mean, I think some of the renewables, I actually think wind farms are probably better in some respects than solar farms. They're both good in terms of generating power, generating power without having mm. to burn fuels to do so. Mm. But wind farms typically do less from a farming perspective. I can keep doing more on my farm with wind farms mm. than I can with solar farms. So I think in general they're good, but the community come along, ask your questions, hear about it. Yeah. And I think some people are just fascinated to learn about it as yep, well. Absolutely. And so a great opportunity to do all that out at Eucarina. Tamworth Country Music Festival. What a great time of the year. Now, I have a feeling that uh, you uh, decided to go up there and have a bit of a check it out. Well, as people are listening to this right now, I'll be driving on my way back from Tamworth. Oh, okay, or, yes. Or just about to. I might be still having coffee with Russell up there at yep. the moment. And it's one of the things, when we talk about regional cities in New South Wales, 15 mm-hmm. cities we have on that, we often talk about sharing information, sharing learnings from across those 15 mm. different cities. Mm. And one of the things we've often talked about is inviting each other to different events that might be on. So, for mm. example, when we did have our last NRL match here, I invited some of the other mayors from the 15 cities to come along and yep. be a part of that and, and just see how that all operates. We've talked before about Mount Panorama, Bathurst, when Bathurst is on. Yes. I've been down to, to Bathurst and just to see how that event runs. It's a fantastic event for yep. their city down there. And certainly Tamworth Country Music Festival, the mayor up there, Russell Webb, mm. invited me to come along and just have a look at it. It's only going to be a pretty short trip. I'll, I'll basically went up Saturday morning and I'll be coming back today, mm. um, you know, sort of mid-morning this morning. There's too many other things on that I, I can't get away for too long. Yep. But one of the things that's great about doing that is you just look at the environment, you look at how they do things, yep. and then I'll sit down again. I might be having a coffee with Russell as you're listening to this mm. podcast or I might have finished that, but I'll sit down with Russell on Sunday morning and I'll just talk about the event, how they've run it, mm. what they've done. One of the things I, I remember before when I've been up there and I spoke to the mayor of the day about when they closed down streets, I said, how did that go down? Because mm. sometimes you close down a street. Some shopkeepers say, this is terrible for my business. Mm. Others say, that's fantastic, you're going to bring in people. And the mayor told me that when they first said they're going to start shutting down streets, there were some shopkeepers who thought that that would be the end of their business. But now... They say, can you shut them down for longer? Because the amount of people that are yeah, around Yeah, right, there, sort of hanging around, that's it. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. And yeah. so it's different. And, and one of the things that's funny is people say, oh, wouldn't it be great to have a Tenworth? It is. Mm. For Tenworth, it's great that they've got Tenworth. And it's worked well. And I think you go back to the early 70s when they first held their first country mm. music awards and then it kind of grew from that. But when I go to Tenworth, people say, oh, you're from Dubbo. Oh, I wish we had a zoo because <laughs> you've got 300,000 people a year that come and they're spread throughout the whole year. Because some people in Tamworth, if I'm a motel mm. operator, for example, say, oh, well, Tamworth's great for two weeks of the year, mm. but I've got to fill the motel 52 yep. weeks of the year, not yep. two weeks of the year. But again, I'm not trying to run Tamworth. Isn't country that the case, down. though, too, though, that it's, it shouldn't really be a competition out here. It should be whatever it takes to get people from the city and from the coast to get them out to the country regions. Because you and I both know, if you're coming to Tamworth, we're not just going to go to Tamworth with a lot of people. They'll be going to other areas as well. They, they may bring in Tamworth as part of a holiday to somewhere. If they're going out to, to come to Dubbo to come and see the zoo, well, chances are if the Elvis Festival's on in parks, we'll go and do both. Um, or if the Elvis Festival's on in parks, we'll duck up there to Tamworth as well. We'll do it as all part of this. So whatever we can share for each other, just to make the people to come out and visit us, it's, the better. I get excited just when I hear regional locations are doing something, something's happening there, yes. or as you say, they're bringing people out. Because yep. I agree with you, it's not a competition. And it used to seem like that, even my early days on council, used to be Orange versus Bathurst, mm. or Dubbo versus Orange, but... As I think we've matured in the way we do things, I think regional areas in general say this is great. So it's not, and again, I wasn't running down Tamworth Country Music Festival no, no, before. No. It is great for Tamworth, but it's theirs. Yeah. I don't want a Tamworth Country Music Festival in Dubbo because yep. that's not ours. No, I that's, don't want that's some, their identity. That's right. And that, but they've done well with that. But they've done well with that. 
over a 50 plus year time frame. Mm. And so that's fine. That's something that's good. But again, it's a regional location, mm. it's a regional area, it's doing something, it's bringing people out there and realizing that. Regional locations don't have tumbleweeds down the main street. And That's right. We have electricity. And so all these silly things that people aren't sure of, that ignorance, mm. it breaks down that ignorance. So absolutely well done to Tamworth. They've yeah. continued to build that, and it is a great event. And I do enjoy going along there. I'm not, yeah. what I would say, a country music fan. I actually found that when I've been to Tamworth previously that – Country music now seems to be more like soft rock, and I'm probably offending lots of people oh, out there well, saying that. Nothing wrong with that, to be honest. Well, no, yeah, no it seems that's good. I was waiting yeah, at one yeah. stage when we were at the Golden Guitar Awards. I was waiting for the country music to start because <laughs> when's the soft rock going to stop and the country music starts? When's the dueling banjos coming on? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> anyway, it's good to get around those yeah, other yeah, areas, yeah. and and we do some road trips as regional cities, New South Wales. We did one last year up to Tweed Heads and Lismore, mm. and we'll do another one this year. Just learn yeah. about different areas. Well, yeah, we've got our own little festivals coming up. We've got a jazz festival coming up. We've got the Dream Festival coming up. So I'm sure when you go away to these sort of places, you're picking up things that you can pass back to these guys running these events as well. Yeah, you are absolutely spot on. Well, mate, it's uh, that time. It's the Limerick of the Week. What have you got for us this week? Well, just because I want to be nice to Russell, I thought this week... I could do it on the Tamworth Country Music Festival, which seems a bit strange because it seems like I'm no, advertising. No, this, this is sharing. This is what's right. sharing and caring. It's what we do. Thank you. That's exactly what it is. Yep. It's about recognising it is a significant event. And again, I think I mentioned last week that I was going to do something on Australia Day, but then I thought I'd do something this Australia Day. But I'll, I'll do it on Tamworth Country Music Love Festival. It. Love Here it. we go. On a road trip, I made my way to Tamworth, where the guitars play. With a nod and a smile, I stayed for a while enjoying each musical display. Ah, well done as usual. Well done as usual. Well, folks, that just wrap, wraps us up again for another Straight from the Mayor's Mouth. Get out there, enjoy this wonderful region we live in. Until next week, take care. Straight from the Mayor's Mouth with Matthew Dickerson from Dubbo Regional Council.